Thank you, Chairman Perry and Ranking Member Titus for inviting me to testify on the National Emergencies Act. Emergencies present a critical issue of checks and balances in the constitutional balance of power. Congress makes laws and appropriates funds. The President implements laws and spends money. In emergencies, though, Congress gives the President and the executive branch fairly broad leeway because of the need to act quickly. But that doesn't mean Congress wants to give the President unlimited power. Members of Congress want to say and have an important role in reviewing, supporting, or curtailing the President's execution of delegated powers. Congress found a solution nearly 50 years ago in the National Emergencies Act. The NEA provides a generalized framework for handling emergency powers. Separate from the National Disaster Emergency System, also under this committee's jurisdiction, note that there is a, a separate public health emergency system that, that we're not talking about today. When the President declares an emergency, it unlocks other laws that provide powers, laws written by Congress delegating congressional powers that the President can use to address that emergency. The NEA gave the President broad flexibility but required clear reporting and it powered Congress to call a halt through a legislative veto. Any member of Congress can demand a vote to block the President's action via concurrent resolution. Consideration of these resolutions was protected via uh, special procedures, and the President could not block that termination. But that system broke in 1983. The Supreme Court decision, INS v. Chadha, struck down the legislative veto that Congress had relied on to review emergencies. Without that check, the delegation of emergency powers was transformed into something far broader. A president could continue the emergency unless Congress could muster a veto-proof majority in both chambers. Indeed, since Chadha, there has been virtually no check on the president's national emergency powers. Members of both parties complain about perceived abuses of executive powers by the president of a different party, but there were little tools to take action. In 2019, Congress started to exercise the re its review power. The NEA requires that Congress shall meet for every six months to review em emergencies, but it never did until 2019 when President Trump declared a national emergency at the southern border. Congress voted two times on a bipartisan, bicameral basis to end the emergency, and in both cases, President Trump vetoed the resolution. Under the original NEA, President Trump would not have had the opportunity to veto. Instead, President Biden ended the emergency in his first day in office. President Trump also declared an emergency and a separate public health emergency over COVID in March 2020. That emergency was unchallenged until March 2022 and terminated earlier this year. Last year, the Senate voted to terminate the COVID emergency in March and then again in November, and this year, the House voted with 219 votes and the Senate with 68 votes to terminate the COVID emergency. And ultimately, under some political pressure, President Biden ultimately agreed to terminate the COVID emergency. Prior to this year, emergencies had only been terminated by presidents acting alone. And only for the second time in history has Congress acted like the, Ma the National Emergencies Act emer imagined it might. But that does not mean the system works. It is still much harder for Congress to exert its review powers over emergencies, much harder than was intended in 1976. Chadha flipped the logic of the NEA completely. What started as exceptional uses of powers reviewed by Congress is now a system where the president can and does maximize power up until there's sufficient public outcry to require him to stop. The current structure of that system is broken by Chadha and treats Congress as a bystander you all are left to cheer or jeer the president, and you're left to cheer or jeer the courts in the inevitable litigation, but that's not what Congress was meant to do. The good news is that there is a solution to restore a proper balance of power over national emergencies. I'm gonna let my colleagues on the panel speak about the existing powers and the solutions to fix it. However, the bipartisan votes against emergencies have been matched by a bipartisan desire to fix the system. Frankly, it has been inspiring to see members of Congress work together in a time of high partisan tension to show real agency to restore the power to Congress. 
My written testimony provides greater details on all of these questions and recent legislative reform efforts. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions. We'll start with you, Mr. Dayton. Uh, can each of you just tell the subcommittee, in your opinion, what are the top two or three emergency authorities granted to the president that might concern you? Well, I, I think the ones you, you mentioned initially, uh, you know, the involuntary testing of, of <laughs> chemical and biological weapons on American, uh, on American people. And I would say in today's environment, uh, the the internet issue that that Ms. Goitin mentioned, just given that the internet is central to everything we do and everything in our homes and things like that. You mentioned a solution is for Congress to uh, exert its authority to end an emergency without it going to the president for needing his buy off on it or his signature. How does the suggestion you made at the end of your talk, Ms. Goitin, get around the Chada legislative veto decision? Uh, I'm happy to weigh in, and, and other witnesses might want to as well. It's, it's, it doesn't the, the, matter who, just you mentioned that solution last time. Yes, no, no, I'm happy to, to explain. The, the way that it works is that the, it requires the emergency declaration, or provides that the emergency declaration expires automatically after 30 days. And so if nothing happens, it expires. It doesn't expire because there's been a legislative veto. It expires because Congress said this can last for 30 days. However, Congress can vote to extend it. And of course, that is a legitimate act of Congress, one that the president is clearly going to sign because it's the president's emergency declaration. Um, and that then becomes uh, an act of Congress that extends the emergency. The Mr. Dayton, you want to add to that? Yeah, just to, just to extend slightly, the, the core concern in Chada is that you have bicameralism and presentment. The, the, uh, and what this does is by having the joint resolution and then the signature, you satisfy the core requirements of Chada. Uh, you know, this is, this is, and it becomes just like any other law. So it's, it's fairly straightforward in that sense. Uh, and this has been discussed, as, as I note in my written testimony, uh, since the 80s, uh, immediately after, I mean, w within a year, then Senator Biden wrote a wrote a piece on this in a in a law review uh, in a law review essay, and and there was an, a, a fair amount of discussion at the time. I think they hadn't worked out the procedural details, unfortunately, and so and so the the there were a series of amendments to a number of statutes, not just the National Emergencies Act, that were impacted that were impacted by this that just changed the requirement to a joint resolution without the sunset. So I don't think it's been challenged, but some people would argue that the War Powers Act is unconstitutional based on Charter. Is that right? Um, well, the, the War Powers Resolution has a couple of additional complications. There, there are some scholars who have argued that Chada doesn't apply. Um, I don't think that would probably stand scrutiny. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been a you know, when, when the War Powers Resolution was passed in, um, in 1973, uh, President Nixon and every president since then has, has, has suggested that their compliance with it does not suggest that they think it's legal. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, the Senate made challenges to the war, or made changes to the War Powers Resolution and the House did not. So there have been two resolutions this Congress uh, introduced by, by uh, Mr. Gates from Florida uh, and I think Mr. Uh, Chairman Perry and I think Mr. Huffman voted for for those re resolutions, but but those actually don't trigger the same processes in the Senate because the Senate changed their the Senate procedures were changed, but not the House one. So it's it's a complicated mess. Uh, and as you move through each set of authorities that use these kinds of procedures, some cases they were changed, some cases they weren't. I go through a couple of those in my written testimony. But it's a, it's a complicated mess that it's inviting a, a solution. And I think this is a great opportunity for, for Congress to sort of reclaim that broader settlement from the, from the 70s that we saw over a, a large number of issues and really show, use this opportunity for bipartisan consensus to get a real win for Congress. Um, but Mr. Dayton, on, on congressional action, I, you kind of walked up to the line, uh, and I just wanted to know, were you arguing we should try to create a constitutionally valid legislative veto? 
And I'm sorry, can you say that again? Oh, you seem to walk up to the line on legislative veto. Did you, do you, are you arguing we should try to create a constitutionally valid legislative veto? I, I think with a sunset system, you can, you can create something pretty similar. It doesn't, um, you know, in the, in the bills that, that Mr. Dalham and, and Ms. Goitine mentioned, yeah. they're, they're typically a one-year extension, and under the original NEA, it could have been cut off after six months. And so there's a, you know, there's a design question about how you would do that, and in a certain sense, you could have cut off at any time. So there's still some really challenging issues. You know, one is, and to use the COVID example, uh, in the COVID emergency, the, the emergency that was declared by President Trump and subsequently uh, renewed by, by President Biden, the only authority it actually claimed specifically was a waiver of Medicaid eligibility. Right. Um, and, and so I think it would be very helpful to also make more explicit the powers that are, that are to be used. Yeah, Some yeah. of that language is in the original NEA, uh, but it's got it's got some language about you know subsequent can, can uh, I, can, executive be, orders. I need to ask another question um, on that. Does the CRA Congressional Review Act is that a reasonable replacement using the CRA, which we've been using? But I'm just wondering if that's a reasonable replacement. The, so, so the CRA would still still has the presidential veto issue, right? right? And yeah. and and so I think if you were to create something similar to the original desire of the NEA that's compliant with Chada, you need the sunset process and the expiration process. And the CRA doesn't have yeah, that. Just, yeah, just we say that the, the proposals that have been mentioned by default create a sunset for any declared emergency. So that's in statute. That's in a normally duly presented statute. So what Congress is voting on is only to extend, not to, not to veto. It's, it's sort of vetoed by default after a certain number of days. It, that's yeah. one way of thinking of it. The president controls the District of Columbia National Guard, while the governors of the states and territories control their National Guards. Do you think Congress should pass legislation to give the D.C. mayor control of the D.C. National Guard? And if so, why? And I... I share Ms. Goitine's concerns. I'd add that the that the D.C. National Guard was actually created in 1802 by President Jefferson to provide security for the White House, which is a natural need. Um, we now have the the Marine barracks, right? The 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 Marines are all over the White House and and provide that function. So so at least the original understanding of what the D.C. Guard was for and why it was a federal. Uh, why it reported to a federal entity just doesn't make sense anymore. You know, I mean, you can all go over to to 8th and G Southeast and see the guard barracks. Um, so, you know, it, it, it seems like that's a place where you just could clean up and treat D.C. like other territories and still have the the, the full power of the president to to use, you know, to, to federalize guards from any state to provide core services. So, you know, I don't think there you run into problems in that way, and frankly, if if you know there are problems in D.C. that might need mobilization of resources, that that I don't see why the president why it should flow through the White House. That doesn't make sense. Uh, Mr. Dayton, the National Emergency Act requires the president to disclose which authorities they intend to use when declaring a national emergencies a national emergency. Mr. Dayton, uh, have presidents complied with this requirement? Uh, not, not always, and it's it's been complicated to use the the COVID emergency as an example. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the that the emergency declaration only mentioned uh, Medicaid waivers. However, the the deferment of student loan payments was announced by press release by the Department of Education in late March of 2020, early April, and there was no legal authority provided until January of 2021. Um, you know, was that legal? Facially, it's 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 plausible. Um, it certainly wasn't. There wasn't a political outcry to stop it. And, in fact, Congress actually included some of those provisions uh, or included similar actions. Uh, but I think this is an area where, where 
we need a healthier system where the president is being very clear about what authorities they want to use and and if they want to use new authorities maybe you know amend the declaration and get a subsequent you know uh, uh, confirmatory action by Congress but I think you could you could set up something that increases the the accountability and frankly as Mr. Tollum said you know gives political cover to everyone um, I think it would have made you know, if there'd been more of a political conversation at a higher level earlier, we might have addressed some of the concerns that, that came up in court at a later date. But my question is, do you believe that the Stafford Act should be reviewed as well as a document that may have lived out its usefulness and perhaps needs to be reviewed in a 2023 uh, scope. My my wife's family is from Baton Rouge, so I understand what what you all have to go through in Louisiana. Um, second, uh, I believe the Stafford Act has been looked at a number of times. It's not like the NEA, which is essentially one and done in '76 and never touched again, except to change change the word concurrent to joint. I think every couple of years there's been some going back and tweaking the Stafford Act because there's you know, a lot of hurricanes and a lot of tornadoes that people need to respond to and we learn things. So, so I think there's probably less of a, of a fundamental problem and I don't think the, the need for congressional review in the same way is necessary because it's really about unlocking funds and as I believe uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Azell said that, that there's been a, a good deal of, of, of reporting out of, out of FEMA unlike in this case. This is an important area, and you're right. It should happen when you've got a president who, 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 who you like, or some people don't like. We've got to go both ways. But I introduced it when Trump was president. I've introduced it when Biden was president. It's, it's the issue. The president could get away with, with all kind of things that he shouldn't, and the Congress is surrendering his power. And I did the same thing with uh, pardons. I had a bill for the whole time that uh, President Trump was in about pardons. I've reentered it now. I don't care if it's Hunter Biden or if it's uh, Donald Trump Jr. The president shouldn't be pardoned, and his family members shouldn't be pardoned, campaign people, et cetera, et cetera. It goes for either party, and I'd hope it'd catch traction now and become law because it's, it's the principle that's important, not the individual, because it lives way after us. No matter how long we live, how many birthdays we have, the law would, would go on, and that's what we need to be looking at. So uh, and it, it, either of y'all have anything you'd like to add or you know, a little cleanup or... The the one thing I would say is I've been, um, as, as I said in my oral testimony, inspired by how Congress has, has worked together on this issue. Um, and I haven't seen people fall away when, when, the, when the parties switch. So, you know, I know you had interest in this issue during the Trump administration and you still have interest in the Biden administration. I know the, the initial bills that, that I think we're working off of were introduced during the Trump administration by Mike Lee and Chip Roy, right? No, you know, people who, who have unimpeachable conservative credentials and they've continued to, to, to push on those issues. And, and so I think we've seen a lot of principled action and I, I should say Chairman Perry joined, joined, that, uh, joined Chip Roy's bill last Congress. Um, so, you know, I, while this committee has not held hearings and partially because you did in the last couple of Congresses, uh, you know, I, I, I hope we can, we can see through to closing that process relatively quickly. If we could spend the next 18 months uh, looking at this issue and coming with a proposal that is not based upon the, the most recent hot button emergency, which undoubtedly there will, there will be one, uh, I don't know, forest fires and I don't know, whatever, there'll be some sort of a national emergency, and, and just divorce ourselves from the current hot button emergency and come with a specific set of proposals to amend the act itself. And I would like to hear from each of the witnesses what that would be, not associated with today's hot emergency, but beyond. Mr. Dalton, what would you do? Uh in, in my testimony, I, I list three components, and there's been a couple more that have been discussed here. One, automatic sunset after 30 days and, and after a year. That would, that would create the, the forcing function for Congress to act. Short version, assume that I know what a sunset is. Keep going. Oh, so, so the, you know, 
the, the president would have, when the president declares an emergency, it would only last for, say, 30 I days understand. until Congress acts. To um, the, the expedited procedures to allow quick consideration by Congress, right? These are, these are about congressional rules. Three, clear reporting and factual declarations and justifications. And, and frankly, I think part of the reason the reporting hasn't happened is that Congress hasn't acted. So why, why send reports if Congress doesn't care? As I suspect some of the insight in, in, the, administ uh, in the administrations going back 20 years. Um, and then fourth, I'd, I'd make specific the, that the, the uh, powers used in the emergency are one, related to the underlying emergency, and if if changes, if new emergent, if new powers are going to be added, it probably needs to reopen the process. I do think that there is an emergency at the border. Now, it's been going on for a long time, which probably wouldn't fit your definition, right? It's it's an emergency that happens every day that Congress just can't seem to, and, and, you know, we can't all seem to get it together and agree to something. But it doesn't mean it's not an emergency problem that ebbs and flows in the state of the emergency. At the same time, I don't necessarily see student loan debt as an emergency that has some kind of existential threat to our country or the people that have the loan or the people that it gave, you know. So, so I, I think maybe, maybe we're looking at it the wrong way, but I don't think we can just disregard the emergency itself. Before I go to you, Mr. Dayton, because I'm gonna run out of time here, because I could spend probably all day here on this, and I imagine you could too. I have a lot of concern and angst about the fact that there is no reporting, there is no accountability, there is no record of the money spent. And that is a phenomenal thing to me. I can't even begin to fathom, and can any of you, has there been any start to an accounting, like just a, an, a, just a conglomeration of the total number of dollars that have been spent on the emergencies over time that we know of, not how they were spent, just like, how much money was spent that we don't know where it is? Has there been any attempt at even doing that? And, and I'll start with Mr. Date. Um, I, I am not aware of one. I, I will say on the reporting issue, if the president actually needed your vote to confirm the emergency, I think you might get the reports, right? I mean, I think we've seen in cases where powers of sunset, I know, I know there's a current debate about 702 surveillance authorities that I'm not taking a position one way or the other, but all of a sudden, when Congress is about to vote on reauthorizing these authorities, Congress gets a lot of material from the executive branch. So I think one thing you can do here is by putting yourself in the driver's seat, by putting Congress in the driver's seat, saying, Mr. President or Mrs. President, if you don't send us this stuff, we're not going to approve it. All of a sudden, I think you're going to get more, you know, more compliance from, from the executive branch. And, and I think also going back, and this is also partially a response to, to Mr. Garamendi's point, that if you, you know, there are going to be different definitions of emergencies. And I think the, the part of the purpose of this structure is to, uh, one, make this a political question that it properly is, and two, we need to, we need to ask what purpose uh, a, a definition serves. Is it to sort of create a norm for the president? Is it for judicial review? Is it to define, to, to more clearly define the nature of the debate in yes, Congress? Yes, to all, I think it's yes. yes to all of it. But I would argue sometimes Congress just gives this power away because they want to get the monkey off their back. You know, but we don't want to be the one to declare war for whatever reasons. We don't want to be the one to, you know, have to step in and solve this hurricane. So let's just let somebody else take care of it because of politics. It's very hard to separate those politics from that policy. Just wonder if you would care to comment on that. I think there's, there's a couple of ways to think about some of these things. You know, one is in terms of accountability, a word we've used, but also you could, you could imagine it is, it is credit, right? To use, to use the, the, you know, this is an issue that will probably split the dais, um, but, you know, if you were in favor of President Trump's border wall emergency, then you get to vote for it as a member of Congress and show your support, right? If you were in favor of President Biden's student loan program, you would get to vote for it. And people would have concrete actions and sort of shared in the credit and shared in the accountability. And I think that would be very helpful for us as a, 
as a, as a society to have a situation where Congress shares more in that credit. Because right now, in a situation like where we have now, you're sort of bystanders in some of this process. And that's not healthy for Congress. That's not healthy for, for our political culture. I want to thank you so much. I can't believe that this hearing is not, I mean, this should be the showcase for Congress. It's unbelievable. So let me, let me just, I want to go through each one of you real quick. Um, do you guys believe that uh, the same person that adheres to these uh, emergencies should be the same person that when they clearly violate the constitutional authority, that they're the ones that stand up and say no, that those can exist in the same universe? Mr. Dayton? I'm, I'm sorry, I was having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Can you restate? Okay, I just want to be clear, and I want to ask you, States of emergency should exist during certain periods of time. So the person that adheres to the, the law when it's put down lawfully, uh, can they be the same person that says no once those constitutional uh, authorities are, have expired? Oh, I, I, I think you can easily imagine a situation where uh, Congress, you know, let's say one of these reforms passed or like happened in, in Wisconsin where the legislature would say that's appropriate now and then come to a different determination when the facts change, right? And I think in many ways we saw that over over the, the COVID national emergency here in Congress where uh, it went from in the Senate from 49 votes last March to, to 68 votes this March. Excellent. 